So we obviously understand that there's a huge, huge need for a storage layer. But how are we going to get there? What does this thing actually look like? Bernie, we're here. We're talking about how Xanium is changing the landscape, not only for Solana, but Web3 as a whole. What will this storage layer look like? Yeah, great question. Thanks for for asking that. So after the first video that we had, that was all about the why and why we're building that. And, you know, that which is all important to me. I always start with the why in my life. Um now, what are we actually building, right? And we were talking about the storage limitations and the only place you can store stuff on Solana is in Solana accounts. Right. So we need to break free from that, right? Also, Solana accounts always have a redundancy of 3,000. You know, every piece of data that any developer stores in Solana, it's always stored on all 3,000 validators, and they all need to keep it in RAM, right? That's a lot of replication. And that's a lot of replication. And um, so what we are building is a second tier of these Solana accounts. It looks like we want to make it as much like Solana accounts as we can mm -hmm. because the developers are used to that. You know, they, right. they, they know what Solana accounts are. Um, but also, they are used to the normal programming model outside of blockchain. And what do we have there for storage? Usually, we have something what's called file systems. Right. File system is something that we all know with our computers and stuff. So it is, um, it is basically like a path, right? You have like users, action docs something with the slash or on windows a backslash in between i'm right? sure people remember the c colon slash slash and then the path that yeah, they want to get yeah, to right yeah, yeah. file explorer exactly yeah, yeah. there we go well dos yeah. ms dos yeah yes. yeah and and that's the file system right and you can create files you can delete them again you can edit them you know you can you can modify something in the middle of a file mm. Um, you can create directories and remove directories and all. That's what I call random access, right? And that's not there in any of the storage projects that are out there on 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 blockchain, on mm -hmm. like Filecoin, Arweave. Arweave, you can't even delete anything. It's just for archival, right? right? That's that's the problem that they are solving, right? That's not making smart contracts more versatile. Mm -hmm. It's not, they, they are not solving that problem, and they don't set out to solve that problem. Right. Even Filecoin is not designed to make smart contracts more versatile and to create new types of apps. It was not the point of Filecoin. Right. It was just storing something and making it like decentralized. Right. But it's not making the smart contracts in any way more versatile. So in that way, what we are building here is super, super unique. We're building a kind of a world file system, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that is random access. It scales to exabytes and more because that's what we need. We need to scale the capacity of storage because the accounts are so limited. And um, yeah, that's what we're building here in the file system model and opening files and positioning the read write head within a file and overriding stuff in them. That's what people have been used to since the 60s or so, right? And and that's a well-known programming model and we bring that to blockchain and why do we do that in order to spark that Cambrian explosion of all different types of web3 apps that are not there today. Now, what does it look like though because is it going to be one of those things that it becomes super cumbersome that it's going to be out of the reach for most people? Or is there going to be a UI UX that actually makes sense for end users? Oh, yeah. So right now we're working on the Xan Miner. And that Xan Miner is super user-friendly, super GUI-friendly. You know, think of, think of any app right now. What app isn't user friendly? If it's not user friendly, it's not being used. I mean, it's in the, it's in the word itself. So we're making sure that anyone, your grandma, your your kids, anybody can do it. You know, it should be that easy, it's, and that's what we're going for. Yeah, here. Yeah. yeah, and that's very different from like running a Solana validator, right? Yeah. It's tough, and you need technical skills, and it's all command line. Mm -hmm. But since we need millions of P nodes, storage provider nodes in the end, right? It has to be super user friendly. We cannot, you know, 
have grandma use the Linux command line or something, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> People talk about scalability all yeah, the time, but yeah, step one in scalability yeah, is making yeah. sure that everybody can actually yeah, do it. Yeah. yeah. So back to what we're building, right? So in the end, if if someone builds a Zandium, a Zandium enabled app on Solana, they'd have to go through a special RPC node. So usually all those apps, they just send their transactions to RPC nodes. Think of RPC nodes as kind of access nodes mm -hmm. to the blockchain. This now for a Zandium app, it has to be a Zandium enabled RPC node. So it's a Solana RPC mm -hmm. node, but that's running our specialized, our modified software. So usually the Solana RPC nodes just run the Solana validator software. Right. And we have a modified version of that that understands the X transactions, right? So mm -hmm. we love this X transactions because it can mean two things. It can mean Zandium transaction, but it can also stand for extended transaction, which is which is what it is, right? right? It can access the storage functionality. It goes into that RPC node. We will provide these Zandium enabled RPC nodes in the beginning, but there might be other RPC providers out there, and we're already talking to some that want to Zandium and Zandium enable their RPC nodes. And then that's a, just a very small modification. And then we have a sidecar process that's called doc. So that's running on the same computer that runs the RPC node. And it's called the doc because it docks to our storage layer. Right? It's kind of the, the, the mediary between the validator software on the mm -hmm. RPC and the Zandium storage layer. And we made that as a sidecar on the request of the Solana validators. They want to not have huge modifications in the validator software, and they don't want to, um, you know, open new ports or stuff That's like that. They want to have that sidecar there. That's kind of independent, and they are independent with the releases and stuff like that. So, yeah. so what would it look like for a current Solana validator? to, you know, start becoming a storage provider through Xandium? Yeah, good question. Um, there's two aspects to that. One is if that Solana validator is also running an RPC node, mm -hmm. then that would mean installing the modified version and sending things off to the dock. Um, the RPC models, the RPC nodes, the business model is very different from a validator because the RPC nodes they sell subscriptions, right, mm -hmm. to to apps that are running out there. And that's like for larger companies or at least some companies that, that want to provide RPC nodes. The other hand is the, the Solana validator. They can get Xandium enabled also, and they can challenge the P nodes, right, because we want to make sure that the P nodes do what they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. store all these uh, all that data, so in our software, we can uh, generate proofs and Merkle proofs of, you know, that they actually do what they're supposed to do. And the validators help sending challenges to those P nodes. They just say, hey, what's in your file, this and that at position 7,846 and then the next 512 bytes, right? That's a challenge. And, and they need to respond back. Of course, this is all encrypted right. and it's based on Merkle proofs and all these things. And, um, and um, yeah, that's something where Solana validators will be able to uh, make additional revenue and, and, and get additional rewards just by participating in challenging our P-Nodes. No, I know that it's very tough for you to become a Solana validator. Not only are the requirements high as far as hardware is concerned, but it also requires a lot of Solana. What, what do people need to, you know, run a Xandium node? Yeah, so, you know, it's like, that's a great question, you know? We're at the very early days of Xandium, right? And when I look at, for example, Solana from, you know, four years back or so when they just started with their mainnet until today, right? The ones that were there in the early days, they had the first validators, they got all the stake because there yeah. weren't that many validators, right? And I know so many people, I, you know, I know a lot of these Solana validator operators personally because I meet them on the on Solana breakpoints and yeah. everywhere. And we're, we're on Discord all the time. And there are so many guys, right? Just really normal guys. They haven't 
built a company or anything, right? They were just there back in the day. They have 4 million sol in stake. And that literally means they make seven figures in hard U.S. dollars each and every month, not year, right? So. Just, just for sitting there and running that validator. Just yeah. for setting it up. Many of them are really active in the community, sure. right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they they don't they don't you know hang out on some island all day. They engage in in governance and all these type of things. I yeah. mean, they're they are all great guys, right? And um, but yeah, they didn't have to go through all the hassle of building a company with tens or hundreds of employees and everything, right? They were just there. And, you know, I think the P nodes are the core of that whole Zandium storage mm. layer, right? They will do the whole, the, 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 the lion's share of the work, the, the, the heavy lifting, and they will get the lion's share of the, of the storage rewards, right? So think of that like when the, when the instructions come through from the Zandium transactions, those apps have to pay fees. They pay the Solana fees today. But they will also have to pay the fees to store the data in the mm-hmm. Zandium storage layer. Over 90% of these fees go directly to the P nodes that do the work, right? They will be able to share it with their stakers. They will be able to share it with um, the validators that challenge them and all these type of things. But most of these rewards will go directly to the P nodes. And you know, if that whole storage layer is successful and we're going to store exabytes or even zettabytes of, of, of data one day, we will need millions of these P nodes all over the world. And they are small computers. They don't need a lot of CPU. They don't need a lot of RAM. But, you know, they need as much storage as possible because your rewards are proportional to the storage that you provide. Right. And they need good internet connection because we need to be fast, right? And, and keep in mind, these P nodes can be ran by anyone. So you don't need to be too much of a techie to be able to run them, but this is meant for the masses. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really exciting to see where we've come so far, the need that we've obviously identified, how you guys are actually creating these things to make it happen. But I want to know the how for the people. So stay tuned. We're going to be right back with you with another episode covering exactly how you can get into this.